Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Well, Elisa, Barbara, and I are delighted to be with you this morning. We wish you all a blessed Sabbath. We are pleased that you have this lesson. Elisa, mm -hmm. will you pray for God's blessing on this morning's study? Absolutely. Dear Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, for giving us a Sabbath day to rest and most importantly to fellowship with you and one another. We pray that your Holy Spirit will be with us and guide us as we study this very important topic. Uh, not only is it important for us to understand these things, but it's deeply personal. And it really touches on habits and culture and you know, many aspects of our society, um, but you have laid out a clear path for us, Lord. So let us, with open hearts, receive your message today. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Elisa. Well, with the memory verse, or the main verse for this week's Sabbath school lesson is found in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7. And it, it says, the rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. I'm not going to give you any explanation on that. I personally am going to tell you that I'll probably use that verse three times in my presentations throughout this, this week's lesson. Um, here's an overview. Most dictionaries define debt as something that is owed, usually an amount of money, a service, or an item of property that is owed to somebody. But debt can also be defined as living today on what you expect to earn in the future. Unfortunately, in a significant number of countries in the world, particularly affluent countries, debt seems to be a way of life. The Bible discourages, discourages acquiring debt. Debt should not be the norm for Christians. In the scriptures, there are at least 26 references to debt, and these are all negative references. They discourage debt. It is important that we understand that the Bible does not say that it is a sin to borrow money. However, the Bible does talk about the bad consequences of getting into debt. Therefore, as we have just read in Proverbs 22.7, God warns us against it. Let's remind what he says. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. When considering financial obligations, Paul counsels, as we read in Romans chapter 13, verses 7 and 8, to verse 7, render therefore to all their due. And he makes a few, uh, he provides a few examples. Taxes, to whom Taxes are due, customs, to whom customs are due, fear to whom fear is, uh, is, uh, is, is due, honor to whom honor. And then verse 8, it says, owe no one anything except to love one another. Incredible scripture, great counsel. The fact that God warns against debt shows us that debt has spiritual implications. As we read in Matthew chapter 6, verses 33, Jesus wants us to prioritize our relationship with him. He tells us in this verse, Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. When we place God's kingdom first in our lives, we, we free ourselves from the desire and the need to keep us with our, uh, to, to, uh, to, keep, uh, to, to, to keep up with our neighbors. When we place God's kingdom first, we invariably experience deliverance from debt. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, God promised his people, the people of Israel, blessings which included fertility, prosperity, success, and security, if they obeyed the terms of the covenant and carefully observed these commandments. Here is what the Lord's promise uh, promises, um, uh, his promise as Deuteronomy defines it. Verses 1 and 2 of chapter 28. 
if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully his commandments, which I commanded you today, then the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice, the voice of the Lord your God. God has an intent to, to bless. You see, God is telling us in the passage of, of scripture, scripture that we've just read, that in the divine covenant, there is prosperity and an end to debt. However, an, exper uh, an experience of love for God is required. A love that translates into obedience to his commandments and, the faith, uh, and uh, faithfulness in tithes and offerings, as we read in the last two lessons, the last two Sabbath school lessons. As we read in Proverbs uh, 22, 7, the creditor is lord, lord of the debtor. And yet, according to Jesus, only God should be our Lord. Here's what Jesus tells us in Mark chapter 12, verses 29. Jesus answered him, The first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. For the Lord is one. He is God. Jesus makes it quite clear that there is only one Lord, and that is God. The Apostle John in 1 John um, chapter 12, verses 15 and 16, tells us, do not love the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Pay attention to these words. Verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. As um, we have just read in uh, the Apostle John makes it clear that we should not conform to this uh, materialistic and consumerist age which leads to indebtedness and insolvency. Rather, we should aim to be transformed by the renewal of, of our minds and strive to know the perfect will of God, as Paul tells us to do in Romans 12, 12 1, 2. This week, our Sabbath school lesson looks into the reasons for that and how to deal with that. I would like to encourage you to pay attention to God's counsel and share this valuable information with family and friends who could benefit from it. Elisa, Sunday's lesson. Please discuss with us the debt problem. Yes, so what is debt and why is it a problem? So it, it's very interesting. Um, Webster's definition it talks about debt as being a state of being, a, a condition you find yourself in. So it's not the occasional loan you make, may take out for something purposeful, but it says it's a state of being under obligation to pay or repay someone or something in return for something received. And another part of the definition was to be deeply in debt to creditors. So really it's, it's a condition, it's a state of being. So if you've listened at all to the news lately, you've heard a lot about debt. Our nation's debt, for one, um, which at the time that I prepared this lesson was $31.46 trillion. Clearly, owning debt, owing debt, which is the amount of money one has borrowed to make purchases to, uh, to cover expenses over time or some other extravagance, it's a fact of life on planet Earth. Some debt may be prudent, such as a home loan, for instance, or a business loan, and some is quite wasteful, such as common credit card debt. So some statistics and facts on debt in America. This comes from Bankrate, and the, the title of the, the piece is Average American Debt Stats. This was taken from January 13 of 2023. 68 percent of millennials which is age 26 to 41 who took out student loan debt for their own education had to delay a major financial decision such as buying a house as a result of that debt 47 percent of americans have more credit card debt than emergency savings and the highest bracket of that happens to be households that are making an uh, annual income of fifty to $75,000 a year. 60% of credit card debtors say they have been in credit card debt for at least a year, 
and 19% say over five years. The average credit card debt per American is $5,221. So some sources of debt include personal misfortune, so a debt that's beyond our control, sometimes that's a natural disaster, you lost your home or possessions through a tornado or something, illness, war, these are personal misfortunes and beyond your control. But then there's ignorance, which is debt from personal vulnerability. So having lack of a financial wisdom and experience and ability or instruction um, when considering whether or not to take on that debt. Another um, source is just greed and selfishness uh, and debt from complacency resulting from bad habits, wastefulness, pride and boastfulness such as, you know, this thing that is on TikTok, I have to have it too. And then there is necessary debt which is more that prudent debt we talked about, the home ownership, children's education, business investments. So if debt is how life gets done in 2023, so when does that become a problem? And what counsel does the Bible have on this topic? So we're going to look at a few texts this morning on that. Uh, we're going to first go to Deuteronomy 28 verses 1, 2, and 12, and this gives us a, a window into God's idea for his people. And it reads, Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain in your land in the season and to bless all the work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. So first, God is asking that we trust him and obey all that he asks of us. He is asking him, uh, or excuse me, he's asking us to put him first in all things, including our finances. And he promises that he will lift us up and pour out such blessings that they overtake us. He also counsels us to not borrow. In his wisdom, God knew that if we became obligated to others, whether that's institutions or individuals, our allegiance would be divided between him and those we owe. God has poured out all of heaven and gave his own son to release us from the bondage of sin. He wants us to live completely free to serve him and him only. It's hard to do if we find ourselves overwhelmed by a mountain of debt and all the pressures that come from that situation. The good news is that if you find yourself in this situation today or in the future, there is a way out. And God will give you wisdom and the self-control to overcome poor habits that may have contributed to your situation. The Bible counsels us to first give back to God what is he, that he asked us in tithes and offerings. And by putting God first in our finances, he can bless our financial situation and help us reprioritize our resources in the proper order. Second of all, the Bible counsels us to be content with what God provides. Food, clothes, shelter, these are all necessary things that God knows we need. Having the latest iPhone may not fall into that necessary category, however. 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 through 9, has also some good counsel, and it reads, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. In these two Bible passages, the Deuteronomy 28 and the 1 Timothy 6, the Bible counsels us on what is the outcome of where we put our allegiance. Deuteronomy had said that if we put God first, 
all his blessings would overtake us. And in 1 Timothy, it says that if our heart is on money and the desire to be rich, we would be led into temptation and a snare and eventually down to destruction and perdition. Ellen White in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, Councils, if those who have not made life a success were willing to be instructed, they could train themselves to habits of self-denial and strict economy and have the satisfaction of being distributors rather than receivers of charity. Overcoming debt problems is difficult, but also very rewarding. Those in this situation may need to make some changes in their lives, their spending habits, and their financial priorities. It is God's desire that his people live free from these burdens. By following God's counsel in our finances, those who are in debt can find a way out, and those who are not in debt can avoid unnecessary debt burdens down the road. So I'd like to transition now over to Monday's lesson. Can you tell us more about following God's counsel for our finances, Barbara? All right. Thank you. I want to start by sharing an article I found in Forbes magazine. And actually, I, I, I pretty much agree with what, what they had to say. Um, the story is about a man by the name of Grandich, who worked on Wall Street, is now doing financial advising from a biblical perspective, and he wrote, he's also the author of a book called Confessions of a Wall Street Whiz Kid. And here's some of what he has to say. Money and possessions are the second most referenced topic in the Bible. Money is mentioned more than 800 times. And the message is clear. Nowhere in scripture is debt viewed in a positive way. <clears throat> He says that his years as a highly successful Wall Street stockholder left him spiritually depleted and clinically depressed. He says that the Bible is an excellent financial advisor, whether you're uh, religious or not. The writers of the Bible anticipated the problems we would have with money and possessions. There are more than 2,000 references, he said. Our whole future... Um, is our, our whole culture now is built on the premises that we have more money and more stuff to feel happy and secure. We have too much stuff because we've bought into the myth fabricated by Wall Street and Madison Avenue that more stuff equals more happiness. He adds that the total opposite is the truth, the opposite of what, the Bible, what it says in the Bible. His number one most important biblical rule of finance is this, and I totally agree with this. God owns everything. You may have bought the house he gave you, but the money to buy it is his. And so we see that, and I have to agree, we, we live in a world that's very material. Um, and at times it can be extremely alluring. You'd have to be made out of steel and synthetic oil, not flesh and blood, to not at times feel the lure of material possessions and the desire for wealth. At one time or another, who hasn't fantasized about winning the lottery? Especially when it's several hundred million dollars, or billion even. Though we all face it, there's nothing wrong with it, and in itself, working hard to earn a good living or even being wealthy, none of us has to succumb to the trap of making idols out of our money. And I think that's really the key, is, is the money more important and the possessions more important than God. We are promised divine power to stay faithful to what we know is right. That is more important because the temptations of wealth and material possessions has led us many, many, many souls to ruin. Matthew 6.24 says, no one can serve two masters, for you either will hate one and love the other, or else you will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now notice, it says you shall not serve. It says you cannot serve, that it's impossible. The interests of God and interests of mammon have no union or sympathy. Just the conscience of the Christian warns him to forbear to deny self 
in these matters. On one side of the line is the self-denying follower of Christ. On the other side is the self-indulgent world lover, pandering to fashion, engaging in frivolity, pampering himself, forbidden pleasure. On the other side, the Christian cannot go. He cannot cross that line. I, when I was younger, I had friends who believed that the one who died with the most toys won. Well, one of them is dead. Now. In fact, the one who said that is now dead. And um, his toys didn't do him one bit of good. So um, if we move on, um, uh, so I want to move on here to what Ellen White has to say. Uh, no one can occupy a neutral position. There is no middle class who neither love God nor serve the enemy of righteousness. Christ is to live in the human agents and work through their faculties and act through their capabilities. Their will must be submitted to his will. They must act with his spirit. Then it is no more they that live, but Christ who lives in them. He who does not give himself wholly to God is under the control of another power. Listening to another voice, whose suggestions are of entirely different character. Half and half services places the human agent on the side of the enemy as a successful ally to the host of darkness. 1 John 2.15 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So we see that <clears throat> there's this common thread we find that this issue of of wanting more is takes us onto the ground of of satan unfortunately the love of the world can be so strong that people will get into debt as a hope to satisfy their love they want to keep up with their, their neighbors they want to have the latest of everything ecclesiastes 4 8 says there is one alone without companion he is neither the son nor brother yet there is no end to all his labors nor is his eye satisfied with riches but he never asks for whom do i toll and deprive myself of good this is also vanity and a grave misfortune so and because debt of is one of satan's nets that he sets for the souls it just makes sense that god would like to see his children debt-free. He has given us counsel through the Bible and the prophetic gift that can lead us to financial freedom. Psalms 50, 14 and 15 says, Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. We should spend time looking at our choices and, and the allure of the world and always turn back to God. Amen. Thanks, Barbara. So, so far, uh, during the, um, the, the week's study, um, as Elisa um, openly discussed, we know how debt comes into being, and that debt isn't really the best solution for a content, joyous, successful life. <clears throat> Barbara has very, very much uh, discussed the godly counsel that is given, that we really need to be giving our souls and ourselves to God, who is the provider of everything we have. And in Tuesday's lesson, we really discuss how to get out of debt. And um, I'm going to do my very best to uh, provide you um, a plan, a, a simple plan, with a premise and the three-step process that I believe could be very successful. So let's, um, let me begin by reminding you uh, what Proverbs 22, 7. It really says that if we have debt, in a sense, we, under, we are under bondage to the lender. The verse says, the rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. This is an unfortunate phenomenon. This is not how God envisages you and I to live the here to live here on earth. So then what can we do 
to escape from this bondage. If you are in debt, the following plan of action or outline can help you begin a debt elimination process. And as I mentioned earlier, the plan is simple. It has a premise, significant premise, and it's a th three-step process. So let's get into it. The premise, which is the foundation and cornerstone of the plan of action, is a commitment to God. You heard that from, from Barbara. It's a commitment to God. You've heard it from Elisa. And so it's a commitment to be faithful in returning his holy tithe to the storehouse. You mentioned that, Elisa. It is a commitment to access God's wisdom and blessing through our prayer life and our communication with Him. You see, God is eager to bless those who obey Him. He tells us in Malachi 3.10, and you should know this verse by heart now, bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me, try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessings that there will not be room enough to receive them. Great promise. Your commitment to God and your walk with God is important. Now, the three-step process in the plan of action. The first step is to declare a moratorium on additional debt. Don't, don't, don't get additional debt. No more credit spending. If you don't borrow money, you cannot get into debt. And if you don't borrow any more money, you cannot get further into debt. Step number two is to make a covenant with God that from this point on, as He blesses you, you will pay off your debts as quickly as possible. As you walk with God and you receive His blessings, pay your debts quicker. When, when God blesses you financially, use the money to reduce debt, not to purchase more things. This step is probably the most crucial. When most folks receive unexpected money, additional money and bonuses, they simply just spend it. Don't do it. Instead, apply it to your debt reduction plan. Step three is the ends on practical part. Make a list of all your debt from the largest to the smallest in descending order. For most families, the home mortgage is at the top of the list and credit cards or personal debt is at the bottom. Begin by making at least the minimum payment due in each of your debts on a monthly basis. And then, next, double up or increase your payments in any way you can on the debt at the bottom of the list. You see, if you ha you, you will be happily surprised how quickly you can eliminate the smallest debt if you do so. Then use the money that you were paying on the bottom debt to add to the basic payment on the next debt as you work your way up the list. As you eliminate your smaller high interest debts, like credit cards and things of this nature, you'll free up a surprising amount of money to place on the next higher debt. You see, King Solomon tells us in Proverbs 15, 22, that without counsel, plans go away, but in the multitude of counselors, they, the plans, are established. See, the Word of God here is encouraging us to seek help if you need help. If you think you need help, I'm going to suggest that you solicit counsel from Real friends, not friends, real friends and professionals. I would suggest professionals being the, the, pri the priority. Sometimes it is necessary to acknowledge the condition of indebtedness and to seek the help we need. You heard Ellen White in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, and Elise has already um, uh, read that, pages 441, makes the following observation. If those who have not made life a success were willing to be instructed to seek counsel, they could train themselves to habits of self-denial and strict economy. 
and have the satisfaction of being distributors rather than receivers of charity. What a statement, and how much truth is in it. Secondly, as you look for counsel, ask for divine help and for wisdom. You see, divine help may come in the form of discernment in the Bible. In the Bible, wise management is a gift from God. You see, the wise man declares, as we read in Proverbs, Proverbs uh, chapter 24, verses 4, that by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious, precious and pleasant riches. And he's really also referring to life itself. We also can ask God for wisdom to take care of our finances, especially in times of economic hardship. The search for wisdom is recommended by James. Here's what James says in James chapter 1, verses 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. I, I really counsel you to do just that. God clearly doesn't want us in debt. By following the steps outlined, many families have become debt-free. This is not an easy process. It requires commitment, determination, discipline, and a daily walk with God based on trust, on belief, and on or in faith with Him. By putting God first, we'll receive His wisdom and blessing to manage successfully what God has entrusted to us. Paul tells us in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5, let your conduct be with that without covetousness. The problem with debt often is that we really want to be just like the neighbor. Be content with such things as you have. For God himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Let's put our faith and trust in God and be content with his blessings. Elisa, surety and get rich quick schemes. Yes. Talk uh, about these. Okay. Yeah, this is also um, a, a bit of a, a touchy topic sometimes because um, also deeply personal. So what do we mean by this, surety and get-rich scheme? So sometimes family members or even friends may ask us to be a guarantor or a co-signer with them as they take out a loan. So how should we respond to these situations? You know, after all, these are people we love, we want to help them out, you know, could be our children. Um, so is it our Christian duty to help in this way? Well, actually, the Bible is very clear that God does not want his people to take on this responsibility and become responsible for the debt of others. Uh, the book of Proverbs has some very clear guidance on this. In Proverbs 6, 1 to 5, it reads, My son, if you become surety for your friend, if you have shaken hands in a pledge for a stranger, you are snared by the words of your mouth, you are taken by the words of your mouth. So do this, my son, and deliver yourself, for you have come into the hand of your friend. Go and humble yourself, plead with your friend. Give no sleep to your eyes, nor slumber to your eyelids. Deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, and like a bird from the hand of the fowler. So this is a pretty strong warning against taking on the debt obligations of others. Using the allegory of hunting, the Bible warns us that becoming another's person's surety in debt is a snare, and you become the prey for the hunter. It goes on to tell us to flee from those situations. In Proverbs 17, 18, it says, A man void of understanding shakes hands in a pledge and becomes surety for his friends. So the Bible is telling us that if we become surety for others, it is unwise, and that we are showing a lack of sound judgment. In Proverbs 22, 26, excuse, yeah, 26 and 27, it says, Do not be one of those who shakes hands in a pledge, one of those who is surety for debts. If you have nothing with which to pay, why should he take away the bed from under you? 
The lesson points out that studies show that 75% of those who co-sign for someone else end up making the payments. So no doubt these situations are the cause of many hard feelings and much strife between friends and family members. God's will is for us to be a light and a witness for him in the lives of others. These kind of pressures are highly likely to get in the way of us being that witness. It is best in these situations to follow God's counsel, no matter how hard it is to say no to those we love. So I'll talk a minute about these quick rich schemes. That's another type of snare, and we may be tempted into these type of uh, quick rich schemes. We have all heard, one or another, those promises that sound too good to be true. They promise that if you just do X, Y, Z, you will make all this money and you'll never have to work again. So the lesson says, stop. You know, it says, run away from these situations. Don't even think about them. So many lives and families have been ruined by these schemes, which end up only enriching a few people at um, the top, uh, you know, who, who started these things. So the Bible also warns about these schemes and the snare of wanting to become rich quick by what appears to be the easy way. In Proverbs 28, 20, it says, A faithful man will abound with blessing, but he who hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. And in 1 Timothy 6, 9, and 10, we had read about in verse 9 that those who desire to be rich are led into temptation and a snare, and it ends up drowning them in destruction and perdition down the road. And verse 10 says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. That's such a sad commentary. So, friends, God is the author of peace, and it is his desire to give us his peace. If our minds are distracted by how to get rich or by materialism and always wanting more possessions, or if we are overcome by our debt obligations, then we are prioritizing these things over God, and we are restricting his ability to impart his peace to us, the peace that he promises us. So if you find yourself in this situation today, it's not too late to turn it over to God and seek sound financial counsel to start reversing your course. Um, as Victor had just laid out that, that short but very effective plan. It may take some hard work and some time, but you will find that as you make these changes and trust in God, he will bring this, his peace back to your situation. Gonna go ahead and go on to Thursday. Sure. Term limits and borrowing points. Mm -hmm. So the Bible looks at term limits and borrowing points very differently than, than we do. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of the example of home loans. Mm -hmm. You can do anywhere from 15 to 50 years on a home loan. And if you take a home loan and you, say, buy a $300,000 house, at today's current rate at six and, what is it, three quarters percent or whatever it is, you end up paying 77000 more in interest mm -hmm. than you do the value of the home. Mm -hmm. And so unless you're in a place where this home will really appreciate and you can sell it for a lot more money, you want to be careful about going into that long-term debt. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I want to move on to Deuteronomy 15, 1 through 5, because I want to look at the term limits mm -hmm that are in the Bible that he created. And it says, At the end of every seven years, you shall grant a remission of debts. This is a manner of remission. Every creditor shall release what he has loaned his neighbor. He shall not exact it of his neighbor and his brother because the Lord's remission has been proclaimed. I'm not sure people would borrow the way they do today if, if this were the case. That's right. From a foreigner, you may exact it, but your hand shall release whatever of yours is with your brother. However, there will be no, no poor among you. 
since the Lord will surely bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess. If only you listen obediently to the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all this commandment which I have commanded you today. The Lord really didn't, didn't want us to be poor. He had a system that he put in place for lending and from keeping people from getting poor. So if we look at what the Lord required of his people, it's revealed in, in some of these verses. And so we'll look at, at, at a few more scriptures here. Exodus 21.2. If you buy a Hebrew servant, he shall serve you six years. And the seventh year, he shall go free, go out free and pay nothing. So even <clears throat> servants were not long-term unless they chose to be. In Leviticus 25, 3 and 4, six years you shall sow in your field, and the sixth year you shall prune your vineyard and gather its fruit. But in the seventh year, there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall neither sow your, your field nor prune your vineyard. So God even wanted the, the land to rest, and he looked at this same seven-year plan for the fields. So, not, so the, the longest anyone could be in debt was seven years. However, we can't take from these verses. They do show that the Lord cares about the kinds of financial issues, especially when at that time they concerned fellow Israelites. The verses also show that the Lord acknowledged the reality of debt. No matter how bad it generally was, he also emphasized that it was to be avoided as much as possible. So we also look at this idea of borrowing money for an education. As a rule, uh, getting a college degree will enhance a person's income capability for the rest of his or her life. Some people might have to borrow some money to pay off their education, but keep in mind these factors. You have to pay it back with interest to get all the grants and scholarships that you can qualify for, work and save all you can for school. Take only courses that will lead to job. Have parents help. In Bible times, parents gave their children farmland so they could make a living. Today, that inheritance should likely be in education so that they can become independent adults. I remember I had to, I had to pay back loans. I also got some grants for working, and when I worked for a certain amount of time, they were forgiven. So look for grants and, and whatever you can find. In an ideal world, there would be no borrowing and no debt. But because we don't live in an ideal world, there might be times when it is necessary to borrow. Just make sure that you have the best deal possible at the best interest rates available. Then borrow very minimum you need to pay it off as quickly as possible to save on interest costs. In principle, however, whatever degree humanly possible, we should seek to avoid debt and follow biblical financial principles in our everyday lives. We can go a long way <clears throat> toward avoiding unnecessary debt and the terrible strain it can put on us and our families. Ecclesiastes 12.14 says, For God will bring every work into judgment, including everything, every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. And he's saying this in the context of, of we becoming lenders. Often um, we become lenders to others, even though it's probably not the best thing to do at times. But God wants us, when we lend as lenders, to be godly people and look at, are we being fair? Are we, is it usury? Are, are we using people? And so we want to be careful if when we lend to make sure that we're using good biblical practices. Ellen White says in the prayer which Christ taught his disciples, he said, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. But this did not mean that in order to be forgiven our sins, we must not 
require our just dues from our debtors. If they cannot pay, even though this may be a result of unwise management, they are not to be cast into prison, oppressed, or even treated harshly. But the parable does not teach us to encourage indol indolence. The word of God declares that if a man will not work, neither shall he eat. We see that in 2 Thessalonians 3.10. The Lord does not require the hardworking man to support others in idleness. With many, there is a waste, that is a waste of time, a lack of effort, which brings poverty and want. If these faults are not corrected by those who indulge in them, all that might be done in their behalf would be putting treasure into a bag with holes. That's a cute analogy. Yet there is an unavoidable poverty, and we are to manifest tenderness and compassion toward those who are unfortunate. We should treat others just as we ourselves, in the circumstances, would wish we could be treated. Yeah. I just want to say one, more, one, one sure. more thing here. One of the scriptures that always comes to my mind when I start to buy something, <laughs> it says, um, it's, it's Romans 13, 4. Mm -hmm. 13, 6, 5. I can't read it. Okay, well, let's do 8. 13, 8. There you go. There we go. Yeah. And it says, Oh, no man anything. <laughs> That's short and to the point. Right. <laughs> uh, I, and, and I'm glad that you mentioned it because I was going to mention it. <laughs> For yes, you? I, I am. I'm going to mention Good. it again. Thank you, Elisa. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you, Barbara. Mm -hmm. I, I hope that uh, this uh, lesson makes sense to you. Um, my closing thoughts are going to be very brief. It's, it's really a counsel, a counsel to you. Paul tells us in 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, and you've already run, uh, heard that, that godliness with contentment is great gain. Mm -hmm. Now let me repeat that. Godliness with contentment is great mm -hmm. gain. And the question is, when you're in debt, are you enjoying contentment? In this statement, Paul defines the most priceless possessions human being can own. A, peace of mind. If you have contentment, you've got peace of mind. And secondly, a troubled, an untroubled heart. A heart that is free from any trouble. You see, billions of dollars are spent annually as human beings endeavor to find contentment and satisfaction. And a lot of those go in to purchase things that we think will give us happiness and contentment. And yet God in His goodness is ready to gift us, not only with eternal life, but also with an untroubled mind. Peace and a heart free from any trouble. A mind that is learned to trust a loving God amid all the uncertainties of life. Barbara just mentioned it. Romans 13.8. Paul tells us, Owe no one anything except to love one another. It is amazing that Paul seems to suggest that when I love Elisa and I love Barbara as my sisters, that there seems to be a debt in there. There isn't. There is a coexistence. There is a quid pro quo. There is a relationship. And it's, but he says, don't owe anything to anyone except love. Because that love is, is vital. You see, it is God's desire that we aspire to a life of content. In Christ, free from death. So contentment, as we've already read in 1 Timothy 6, 9, safeguards us from compromising the principles of faith to become rich. I'm not going to read that verse again. We've already read it a couple of times. Therefore, as God advises in Luke chapter 14, 28, we need to plan our financial obligation wisely. And the Lord tells us in this verse, For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost 
to ensure he has enough to finish it. What great counsel. In other words, do not spend money you do not have. Do not spend more than you can earn or that you earn. In other words, be prudent, be wise. Elisa read it, and I'm not going to read it. We also need to avoid to assume responsibility for someone else's debt. So be careful with that. Solomon is very, is, is very quick to... By the way, when, when Elisa was, was reading Proverbs chapter 6, verses 1 to 5, Solomon was writing to his son. He actually says, Son, my son, he says, if you become sh surety for your friend, if you have shaken hands in pledge for a stranger, this was verse 1. Verse 2 says, you are snared. In other words, you're trapped by the words of your mouth. You are taken, he says. In other words, you're enslaved, just as we read um, in the beginning, by the words of your mouth. And then he says, so don't do it. By following these sound biblical principles, we will develop diligence and will be prepared for the difficult times and unforeseen situations. It's just that way. When we walk with God and follow his instruction and his counsel, we will have contentment. When we refrain from accruing debt and from the love of money, we Christians, will experience the joyful blessings that God promises to the faithful in Malachi 3, verses 10 and 12. I'm going to say this. I, I want to say this as well. It is just am amazing that often debt comes in because of our desire to establish ourselves in the world. And you define the world however you want. And yet... Christ tells us, you're only but pilgrims in this world. You're in the world, but not of the world. Move on into the Jordan so you can cross it into the new Jerusalem. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for the counsel that you provide. And yes, Lord, if we follow your advice, your counsel, which is to give ourselves to you entirely, that you'll take us into a journey of great contentment and blessfulness. Father, give us not only the wisdom, but the strength which motivates commitment and ability to entrust you with our entire life and everything in it. And Lord, Take us by hand, step by step, and show us, Father, the incredible blessing that you are. I want to thank you for the counsels in Scripture, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.